Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. It was forecast to come and it did. The flood of 2019 has proven to be the worst we've ever seen in the longest. We'll look at what's happening now, what's happening next, and why the first of the downtown festivals is moving to higher ground. It's all coming up in the cities. A record crest coupled with a downtown Davenport flood wall breach. This flood of 2019 has lasted longer than any on the Mississippi. Is the worst now over? And what do we do as we wait for the river to eventually get back into its banks? Joining us is Davenport Mayor Frank Klipsch and Dave Donovan, the director of Scott County's Emergency Management Agency. Thank you both for joining us right now. Can you give me an update? What are we expecting as we head into the weekend and into next week? Well, fortunately, um, I was on the line with the American, I mean, with the uh, National Weather Service and with Dave, of course, and uh, we're having a steady decline of the water, of right. receding. Uh, any rain looks like it'll just slow that down, but won't increase any higher water. So we're very encouraged by that, and that's a, a very good sign. And we actually have some workshops in place now on recovery and how we can all come together to make sure everybody gets up and operational as quickly as possible. And Dave, are we in that mode right now? I mean, we're still obviously fighting the flood, but are we moving closer to the area of, of recovery and moving on? Yeah, we're in that transition period, I think, now, Jim. Um, We've moved from response, obviously, um, you know, the, the height of the flood battle. We're looking at the river with a wary eye at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're moving towards recovery. We're doing planning now, working with our community partners. Um, we're obviously looking towards the state of Iowa, uh, as well as our federal partners at FEMA uh, for a potential presidential declaration. Uh, that paperwork's in right now. We're waiting on an answer on that. Now, when we're talking about the river and holding back on the uh, Iowa side, it's either levees or Hesco barriers, there's temporary walls, there's sandbags, there's permanent pr flood protection and all that. How long does that have to be monitored? Because let's be honest, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean this in the only the nicest way, a tornado comes and it goes, a fire right. comes and it goes, a flood comes and it stays. Especially with this uh, particular event, I mean, we've been under water for some 45 plus days at this point. Uh, and so where we have, even where we have permanent flood protection, mm -hmm. for example, the, uh, the city of Bettendorf's uh, levy, their dike, um, it's, you know, it's susceptible. Uh, you know, we're not worried about it at this point, but the longer things stay under water, we're seeing water incursion behind flood protection, both permanent and temporary. That is something we have never seen before. We've set the record by a long shot here, by a couple weeks. Uh, in terms of the the amount of time that we've been up in major flood stages so that's concerning we're learning from that obviously we've begun to talk about that as we look at uh, you know temporary solutions or permanent solutions and things that we need to be cognizant of and aware of and plan for well it obviously leads to what happened downtown Davenport with mm -hmm. the HESCO barriers with the uh, uh, HESCO said that they brought in a specialist to take a look right, trying to right. figure out what exactly happened the person that what came from HESCO believes that it may have percolated under the road somehow there was a failure beneath their barriers and that's before that video from uh, Rome the uh, surveillance mm -hmm. video shows right. it, it apparently coming over the top or at least breaking through the upper third of the Hesco barrier. Any idea right well, now? Well, I think happened? you know we have to realize this is kind of like we're in the fourth quarter of the big game. Absolutely. We need to finish the game before we really analyze it and go on to what we're going to do the next time. Uh, but yeah, when you look at that video, it has a variety of things. There it creates a tremendous amount of, of pressure when that builds up like that underneath the ground is so saturated. Did we have actually a collapse on the ground below it, a sewer mm -hmm. breakage? We hope not. But we're going to analyze all of that and then get the core involved as well as Dave and I, I got to give Dave and, his, and the organization a shout out I've been at the command center a lot during this time period they do a phenomenal job we had everybody that was in the room from the Corps of Engineers to FEMA to all the elected officials and police and fire everybody was there so we can make rapid decisions and did a great job I think doing that with all the people that we had involved in that process when you did see that surveillance video what was your first impression when you did see it well, the good news is, fortunately, we had been out and told people it was coming. I got them an hour of notice. They were out moving cars before that even breached, but just to be safe. Um, again, that was a temporary protection. And I think it, it shows the importance of that 
pre-warning system they want in place because the water rose pretty quickly right there as it is it equates itself always absolutely um, but again it leaves what did happen there and we're as anxious to find specifically about it but that was just one small part there was a lot of hesco temporary and and dikes along the other that all have been maintained we're watching all of them now and then again as we're starting to think about positively about recovery and helping people we've got some workshops going on with homeowners and businesses how can we help them get ready for the recovery period overall are you satisfied with how the hesco barriers have worked because you, you've used them in Oh, how many floods now over it's the been last about decade? About 11 years, yeah, about about 11 years. Well, I think, yes, I mean, you know, we're going to learn from this. Um, any particular, this is, if it is some kind of a problem, it is one seam on a long stretch of HESCO barriers that were used in other parts of the community as well. East Village used HESCO barriers for the first time we had to use f uh, temporary flood protection there. So I think uh, they've got a, tr a great record and uh, we're going to continue to obviously review it, but make sure going forward that we have, uh, we've learned everything we can from this and make sure we're even better prepared in the future. You got some stinging criticism from the former public works director who says that the wall should have been built higher, should have been reinforced in the back. I mean, is, is that 2020 hindsight or, or is that something that also has to be looked at? Well, we can call it a variety of different things, 2020 hindsight, but or whatever it is. But this is for someone who wasn't on the ground here, mm -hmm. didn't see the status being how it was set up, didn't see the hard work of all our public work staff come together, and kind of uh, from a distance looking out and seeing uh, an opinion that may not be fully fleshed out. So I think that's something, obviously, anything that we can take a look at, we're going to examine, make sure that we uh, learn what we can from this incident, and then make sure in the future we can even be better prepared. And, and just to let everybody know, there's a lot of people talking about you should have a flood wall. Well, the reality of this, that'll be explored, but I think it's important to understand that if we had had a flood wall, Buffalo may not be in existence anymore. Uh, as it funnels the water down river, uh, I've had a number of mayors, I'm in that Mississippi River Cities and Towns group, 88 mayors, and I have a number of them called, thank God the way you handled it, because we might be co totally in disaster for our entire community, because you dissipated a lot of water here, and uh, if the HESCO, that one area had been maintained, we'd be having a different discussion now. Well, Dave, I want to talk to you in just a second, but I want to follow up with the flood wall <laughs> question, sure. of course, because, I mean, when you're talking about flood wall for Davenport, you're not talking about just for the downtown area. This is something that has to stretch quite a ways it had been studied in, I want to say, 2013, and I thought it was that the federal government would not help pay for it, but they would help pay to protect the Iowa American Water Plant. Well, and they did. Did and I? Am I misunderstanding? Well, again, this that was study? a little before my specific it was. tenure, and I w will reach out to that. We'll include the Corps of Engineers in this. You know, I've had speculation of numbers of what it would cost between 75 to 150 million dollars. Um, and as you mentioned, there was some discussion that the government would not pay for that. Um, that's all speculative at this point. Whatever that report showed, it's kind of a new era and we're mm -hmm. going to look at it clearly. We're going to discuss what's happened, um, what they get their input, get the Corps of Engineers involved. They were on, they were calling us right from the beginning. Colonel Sadiger and Colonel Honard from the local uh, uh, Corps of Engineer office were calling us. How can we help? What can we do? We're going to discuss this and analyze it in depth and then come up with a long-term strategy. Not only how it affects Davenport's, but it expects, you know, if we put up a wall, what does that even do to Rock Island and the Illinois site? Mm. Also, what does it do to everybody downriver as we move forward as well? And, and a lot of the businesses have told me, we love the riverfront. 98% of the time, it's fine, even those that some have water in them now. So we want to get everybody involved, make a long-term decision that's best for the entire community. Dave, take me back to Tuesday because, I mean, <laughs> you know, we were live down there. We saw Damport firefighters, first responders, police. We saw neighbors helping other neighbors. Was there a plan for a possible breach? And if so, did it work? Because there were people that were rescued. There were no injuries. Um, you know, there's cars that are damaged. Of course, businesses got swamped. People helped out with sandbags. It was really an amazing effort, no matter how you look at it. As an emergency um, management director, was this the way it was supposed to go? This was the way it was supposed to go. Um, we don't plan for specific incidents like that at a specific location, but we, what we plan for are concepts or functions. So firefighting is a function, search and rescue is a function. And so our search and rescue, water search and rescue in this case, 
um, was implemented. Davenport Fire, Chief Carlson and his uh, team was, were amazing. Uh, we almost immediately had support from the Coast Guard in that effort as well. Um, and I think it, you saw, as you said, neighbors helping neighbors, uh, people helping each other. Uh, Davenport had a, a, a warning, uh, you know, out already, just sort of preempting people and, and explaining to them that there could be a problem. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I was very pleased with how that all came together, the actual response itself. Um, you know, and then as the river uh, rose higher and higher, as the mayor said, our emergency operations center was in full speed ahead gear up there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, you know, as many as 50 or 60 people in that room uh, discussing decisions, talking about things like the wastewater treatment plant, talking about things like Iowa American Water right. and their flood protection system, working with the railroads uh, on when we were closing things, when things were happening, different triggers. Of course, the projections changed. Uh, Sunday into Monday and, and it, to the tune of over a foot. Dramatically so, changed, yeah, yes. Yeah, and so that was a challenge for us. Um, but again, everybody adapted to that and the city's plans, you know, they've got a very robust flood plan uh, that, and they had plans for dealing with just that uh, uh, instance. My focus keeps being on Davenport and that's, not, you know, that's not fair because it's more than Davenport and Scott County that's been sure. affected. You think of the people that were sandbagging in Buffalo in particular and, and, and just the fear and anxiety that you saw there. The mm -hmm. work that's being done at the uh, Garden Edition with uh, actually the National Guard coming in to help monitor some of these uh, flood protection walls. I mean, tell me about the other areas of Scott County. I mean, are there still serious threats right now? Um, I don't know about serious threats. The, the more that the river goes down, the further along we get without heavy rain, um, the better we begin to feel about it. We can't let our guard down at this point, but there have been heroic efforts up and down the river uh, from Princeton on the north end of Scott County all the way down to Buffalo on the southern end and, and all the spaces in between. Uh, City of Leclerc, unincorporated Scott County, Bettendorf was part of the flood fight, obviously Davenport. Uh, there are amazing stories. Uh, of, of heroism, and I do not use that term lightly, and I truly mean heroism. Uh, people that were on flood watch for two or three days on end. Uh, it's part of the reason why the National Guard was called in to help relieve some of those folks. But yeah, we're still concerned, obviously. We're, the ground's still saturated. We're still very susceptible and vulnerable at this point, and so we don't want to let that guard down. But every day that goes by with less rain is a, is a good day for us. I know it's, it sounds dumb to say this, but while you're you know, fighting a fire while you're trying to save your business or your home, you should also be keeping up on your bookkeeping. Correct. It sounds dumb, but can you please tell me what you want people to do in case they believe they're going to get any type of money back from the federal government, any type of flood protection? So I think the, the first thing I'll say is uh, private insurance always, that's where you start, right? Uh, FEMA will come in and they, they assume that there's some level of uh, personal uh, insurance, whether it's on a business or on a home. So that's where you start, but document. That's the best thing. Um, take photographs, uh, keep track of the amount of time that you spend, as well as any volunteer help you may have get, whether it's neighbors or your church group maybe that came out to help you do things. Document, document, document as, as to the greatest de degree as you can. Keep track of your receipts, uh, keep those in a safe place. But uh, photographs are very powerful evidence at this point. Uh, and it will remain to be seen whether or not we um, get that presidential declaration that we're striving for. Uh, that application has been submitted. We're hopeful at this point. Uh, and if so, we'll learn more about that. We've been in touch with uh, FEMA already. We've been in touch with our partners at the state of Iowa. And we're working towards that right now, trying to put together a plan for recovery, as the mayor said, that makes sense for all of us. It'll be, um, you know, it'll be countywide. It actually will be quad citywide in some uh, uh, respects because some of the organizations serve both Rock Island County and Scott County, and there are impacts with our neighbors uh, to the south or east, depending on how you're mm -hmm. looking at it. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we really need to move into recovery, but documentation is the key. Jim, can I mention one other thing? I, I think it's important also, uh, we were out on Friday with the governor who was here. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we went well past. Uh, 280 bridge and had to get on fire boats to come back up the Mississippi to go to the water treatment plant and the staff there had been in the building since Monday they had been there they stayed an entire week rotating on shifts uh, because it's important you think about what happens if that plant goes the impacts on so many people and so many homes throughout the entire community so those guys also did heroic efforts but I can't there's so many people police and fire individuals that came together and we, we have to understand this was the most precipitation over the last year in the last 124 years in Iowa. And at the same time, we had droughts during that same period. Mm -hmm. So it's a crazy time, whatever we want to call it, there are changes 
in our weather and uh, and we've got to be prepared for that and that's part of what we'll do in the future as we look towards the future initiatives that we're going to have for the not only the riverfront but our entire community and it's a problem that is not going away anytime exactly. soon exactly and there's resources out there contact the city contact what scottcountyema.com. Okay. Uh, we'll post it all to our website. We do have a donation center that will be opening up at the former Office Max space at North Park Mall. Uh, we'll also open up a disaster resource center once we find out what the scope and scale, whether or not FEMA is coming to town. We'll put try to put all of those resources in one place, make it as convenient as possible for everyone all throughout Scott County. Dave Donovan, Emergency Management Director, Mayor Frank Klipsch, thanks so much for joining us. We My do pleasure. appreciate Thank you, it, Jim. of course. In a moment, arts seeking higher ground as well, where the Bow Arts Festival is heading to get away from the floods. But first, Laura Adams, out and about. This is out and about from May 6th through 12th. The Bow Arts 66th Spring Art Fair takes place May 11th and 12th and all mothers receive free admission to Niobe Zoo on Mother's Day. Or treat mom on May 4th to the sights, sounds, and shopping along Highway 150, beginning at Route 6 in Coal Valley to Galesburg for this Mother's Day weekend tradition. The Blackhawk College Community Band presents a free concert in Building 4 titled A Cross Section of Music, while the Quad City Wind Ensemble present Quintessence, their spring concert at the Galvin Fine Arts Center on the campus of St. Ambrose, May 11th at 7.30. The beautiful drama Silent Sky by Laura Gunderson continues on the Black Box Theater stage in downtown Moline through May 12th. Circa 21 presents the Laugh Out Loud musical Grumpy Old Men, and for kids, the delightful tale Junie B. Jones is not a crook. Timberlake Playhouse and Magic Owl Children's Theater in Mount Carroll present Elephant and Piggies, We Are in a Play through May 11th. And the QC Theater Workshop presents the timeless tale of The Little Prince, an original production for kids and the adults in their lives through May 19th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. The flood of 2019 is a record breaker, beating the high level marks of 1993 and 1965. The late Ellis Kell told the tale of the flood of 65 in the styling that made Ellis a beloved storyteller as well as a respected bluesman. Here's Ellis Kell, recorded at the River Music Experience with the flood of 65. Saw the river crest, 22-5 at his best, 
He took a little bit of a saw when he finally went down Now I'm sitting here on the riverbank Watching a big old barge locking through Never forget the flood of 65, let me tell you now The power that the river showed When the banks weren't banks no more The Mississippi left us handing helpless in the mud We were banging at the levee, the skies were looking heavy We prayed that it would soon subside We pray that he deliver all the folks along the river from the waters of the flood of 65. We were begging at the levee, the skies were looking heavy. We pray that it would soon subside. We pray that he deliver all the folks along the river from the waters of the flood of 65. Thank you. That's Ellis Kell recorded at the River Music Experience with The Flood of 65. Well, the flood of 2019 is leaving an impact up and down the Mississippi. It's already leaving its mark on downtown Davenport festivals. The first is the Bow Arts Fest. It had to move to higher ground. And joining us is Sharon Larson of Larson Watercolors and the Bow Arts Fest. How are you? I'm good, thank you. You love being downtown, whether it's in the spring by the Figgy or in the fall over at Bechtel Park. But Definitely. this year just would not work. It wouldn't work and we were kind of scrambling what were we going to do. We knew parking would be extra difficult with the flood and just in the nick of time to save us was the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds and they messaged us on Facebook and offered their space for the fair. Just that easy, huh? That easy. <laughs> <laughs> but not so easy for you guys. I mean, a, 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 a festival, a fair takes a lot of planning. What has to be changed in order to move to the fairgrounds? Is there a whole lot that's different? There is a lot that's different. I mean, we, we started in 1953, mm -hmm. so we're on our 66th year, and uh, it was pretty well mapped out. We knew what we were doing, we'd done it before, so this threw a little glitch, but we got it figured out, let all the artists know of the changes, and super optimistic that it's gonna go well. Well now, for somebody who's going, was planning on going downtown, they're gonna go, oh, we're gonna go to the fairgrounds, there won't be that many people, no. Almost every single one of the artists and vendors, everyone's going to be there. Yep, absolutely. We have 114 artists, and they range from Arizona to Florida, I South saw. Dakota. Yep, 14 different states. Wow. So, I mean, 114 artists, that's a lot to choose from. A lot of people also use this period of time, you know, in the spring in order to find things, at, whether it's for their garden or for something outside. I mean, tell me a little bit about the Bow Arts Fest for the spring. You've got a little bit of everything. Yeah, this spring, um, well, it's a Mother's Day tradition for Absolutely, sure. People yes. come back year after year with their grandmas and aunts and, uh, and family members. It's so fun. It's a fun time of year after a long winter and a lot of rain. It's just a, a fun, lively uh, experience. Lots of art. There's beautiful glass, paintings, jewelry, ceramics, uh, metal, uh, metal objects, and pottery. It's there's so much to choose from. It really is hard just to center on one particular thing, but that's right. kind of the beauty of the Bow Arts Fest, isn't it? I mean, that you are trying to bring in a bunch of different artists right. as well as a bunch of different uh, genres of artistry. Yep, there's something there for everyone and, and also a, a big array of price ranges. What, because uh, uh, we were talking about the vendors being there, I mean, there's going to be food as well. I mean, that was always kind of a part of being downtown. Yep, we have four uh, food vendors there ranging from from drinks to popcorn and different mm -hmm. types of meats, all the fun, fair food. Well, let's be honest, I mean, when, when it's downtown, you gotta find a parking space. At the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds, parking's pretty available. It's gonna be much easier, and that was one of the perks that we made sure to let the public know. Uh, much easier to navigate the parking, and it will, it will be just as easy for artists to mm -hmm. unload all of their merchandise, too. Let's talk about where the money goes to. Um, now, entry is very expensive. It's free, isn't it? It's for, yeah, for the public <laughs> to come into the fair, yes. The artists, however, do obviously pay a booth fee, and all of the money we collect from that goes to the Figgy Art Museum to support the children's educational programs. And, and, and obviously, that's, that's an area that's very dear to your hearts. I mean, in the art community to help grow, Definitely. to help foster arts. I mean, tell me how the, how, how the programs work for Figgy. 
Uh, that, I'm assuming you'd have to check more sure. with the figgy on how they actually use but, but that. But the key is, is that, I mean, you know that there's so many art projects at the figgy for oh, children. Oh, for sure. And the fact that you're able to support that or help support yes. that means an awful lot. And we're guaranteeing that there's future artists to, you know, one day become the artists at the Bow Arts Fair. You said that it's a tradition, and it really is a tradition in the Quad City area. How important was it when you saw the waters creeping up that, nope, this festival is going to be held no matter what? <sighs> I'm not sure it was even a thought for more than 30 <laughs> seconds, you know, like should we cancel? We just dismissed that right away. We had a few other options in the wings. We were, we knew that we would keep going. Um, it's for the public, you know, it's, it's, it's there because we love art and we love to share our art and it wasn't a, an option to not have one. And you don't want to tamper with somebody's mo Mother's Day weekend, right? Right. <laughs> a lot of people are banking on this happening. And before I forget, um, if moms go on our Facebook page, there is a special phrase that if they come up to the information booth and say it, they get a, a little prize oh, and a chance nice. to win some pretty cool stuff. That's very nice. Now, of course, an organization like this, trying to raise money as well, I mean, through the, uh, the booths, uh, but you really depend on volunteers. And I know each year you're looking for more volunteers. Always. If somebody wants to take part, because what a great, great program. Well, if somebody wants to take part, how do they do it? Uh, it's super simple. They can go to our website, which is www.boartsfair.com. And on the homepage there, there's the options to volunteer time and, of course, money. Uh, however anyone wants to help out, we're ready to take them. And then let's talk about the fall. I mean, it's coming up September 7th and 8th at Bechtel Park because it's a twice a year. It is. Bow Arts Fest is, is a twice a year event. Yep. Uh, what's the difference between the fall and the spring? It, it's, it's smaller in the fall. Yep, it is smaller in the fall. Um, it just stays on the plaza there in front of the, the figgy. Um, some different artists, some of them come back for both of them a year, but this mainly it is just smaller, but it's still just as wonderful. Yeah, just, just a way to keep it going, right? Yep, yep. All right. And well, it's great for Christmas because that's not too far away from September. <laughs> Very good idea, exactly. <laughs> well, Sharon, once again, your best sell. It's going to be at the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds this year. Yes. Very easy to get to. Yep. And both days you're open. Yep, both days. So Saturday, it's from 10 to 5, and Sunday, it's 10 to 4. Sharon Larson from the uh, Bow Arts Fest, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The waters might rise, but it does not put them out of business. No way, no how. WQPT is looking for young people interested in broadcasting and helping their community. You can represent WQPT as one of its ambassadors for the summer. Ambassadors are college students who meet the public at various WQPT events and programs. It's really an opportunity to get some real-world hands-on experiences. Go to our website, wqpt.org, to learn more and to apply online. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.